I'm going to start my timer here as well. I'm going to do my best to also stick to eight minutes so that we have plenty of time to talk. Um, and I apologize, I've never presented on a screen that looks anything like this. You'll have to excuse some uh, wordy, difficult to read slides, but don't worry, I'll talk it through. Um, and I want to thank the organizers um, and all of you for being here today. I'm very excited to be a part of what I understand is starting these conversations in design media arts. I'm going to focus primarily today on um, the kind of pedagogical end of what I do here at UCLA and conclude a bit by talking about the research I'm just beginning for my dissertation, which does take up some of these issues as well. But what I'm arguing primarily today is that focusing on pedagogy uh, on both, I'm going to be talking mostly about formal pedagogy in the classroom with undergraduates, but that focusing on pedagogy is a key aspect of social justice work and that teaching critical data literacy along with other kind of digital um, sk literacy skills is a key part of what we need to do. Um, so I'm going to talk about two different courses. Um, the first is one that I've proposed but have not yet taught on gender, sexuality, and digital culture. Um, and the kind of idea for this course came from kind of my own interest and engagements with kind of ideas on the feminist internet, um, as well as uh, teaching. Um, I was a TA in uh, the Intro to LGBT Studies class. Um, and we got to the end and realized that we really hadn't done much with digital culture and can, is it really a responsible kind of an effective engagement with our undergraduates to talk about what being LGBTQ means or the potentialities for kind of LGBTQ identity and life today without talking about the digital. Um, and I've also found related to that that talking about the digital is a very powerful way to talk about social justice with undergraduates. It already has a key kind of relevancy to their everyday lives and it can make some difficult concepts easier to grasp in that way when there's already at least some kind of level of understanding and engagement. It also heightens the kind of importance of doing that work. So um, this course takes on a number of key questions, thinking about um, what it means uh, in the digital age um, to think about gender and sexuality, both how um, notions of identity and embodiment change with the digital, how those notions of uh, gender and sexuality don't change with being digital, and how those translate into new forms of media. And so I want to give you a couple examples from each of the classes I'm going to talk about of some of what happens there. So this is um, just one of the units, but I'm particularly interested in, this will become clearer when I talk about my own um, research as well, but I'm particularly interested in how um, sexuality translates onto the internet and how ideas of embodiment work in a digital space. Um, and I think that the this unit of the course focuses on how the digital affects our feelings and relationships as documented in digital technologies and how those digital technologies might alter, augment, or distance the way people's re people relate to one another and how the internet intervenes into the provenance of the body. Um, topics in this section include, of course, online dating and relationships, um, pornography, research on sex on the internet, both what we can kind of learn about sex and sexuality from what people are searching in particular. Um, there's really fascinating kind of big data work on what you can learn from what people are searching about their interests, desires, etc., and what you kind of can't learn, how those truths are reflected or not in a digital space. Um, this section, of course, deals also with the implications for how dating and relationships look different on the internet, um, the possibilities for community, um, and as well as issues. Um, you'll see here there's an article as well on kickstarting trans, um, thinking about the potential for crowdsourcing and how that might uh, engage people in different kind of communities and um, identity practices that they were not engaged in before or expanding those communities in new ways. The other course I want to talk briefly 
about is one that I'm teaching right now to 30 undergraduates. Um, it's one of our core courses, um, or one of our three courses offered to undergraduates in information studies. Um, it's a GE course, so it's open to any undergraduate. Um, we don't have our own major at the moment in information studies. Um, our department has a social, an explicit social justice mission, and it's one of the reasons that I think many of us as students and faculty are drawn to this department and to this discipline. Um, but this course takes a, a very explicit focus on social justice to investigate the political, the economic, the legal, and the technological aspects of the way in which information is created, accessed, used, controlled, discarded, and destroyed. Um, and it draws on a huge um, interdisciplinary set of literature from information studies and related fields. And it focuses particularly on the digital and on contemporary events to um, explore issues of information and power. So again, um, I want to talk briefly here about kind of one unit of um, the course. So whether or not there are, in fact, digital divides and who might be is divide even a useful way of conceptualizing uh, differential access? Is internet access a human right? And if it is, how do we actually enact that? Um, and how do we think about um, issues? Um, Faye Ginsburg works, work focuses particularly on the kind of um, use of indigenous communities to um, rethink um, and to explore in new ways their own identities and to give people access to kind of indigenous knowledges. Um, this unit also, I had the privilege of bringing in two of my um, fantastic colleagues who are doing a very important project on police data um, practices uh, and um, their work uh, is able to talk to give an important instance of what critical data studies are. Um, and I think critical data studies are a particularly important segment of this, excuse me, that larger project of teaching social justice because we live in a world where um, data is constantly being collected about us, we're constantly creating data, but we don't always think of data as something that has a point of view and a perspective from design onward. And I'm hoping that by educating a set of undergraduates, we can create a kind of more set, critical set of designers, users, uh, educators, and those engaged with technology. So I think there's a number of reasons why doing this work really matters for students. Uh, I see this as part of my own um, engagement in social justice concerns. Uh, I think for students to actually be able to interrogate uh, issues of power and information, they need to understand and be literate in um, data in thinking about issues like the other two presenters have already talked about, about the kind of biases of the technologies they're engaging with. I also think that enhancing their understanding of the roles of data, information, and the digital more broadly, um, and giving them access to a different set of kind of disciplinary knowledge um, can inform their, uh, their intellectual lives, their personal lives, um, their lives as kind of citizens in a kind of globalized world, and thinking about how such education might impact their identities um, and their re own reflections on social justice work. Uh, I mean, all of this work is aimed at giving them kind of a critical vocabulary and perspective on these concerns, introducing them to the idea that search engines have biases um, they all use search engines, uh, but most of them have never thought critically about them as a tool. So this is a really exciting um, possibility to, in, to get them to think critically about the structures that are often too invisible in their daily lives. I also want to talk very briefly, and we can talk more about this um, in the Q&A, um, about my own project. This is my third year. Um, in the department, so I am developing um, my dissertation project this year, which is very tentatively uh, titled, Your Nostalgia is Killing Me. Um, and this project takes its title from the poster you'll see here, which is by two activist artists, Vincent Chevalier and Ian Bradley Perrin. Um, in the setting for this poster, uh, it's designed to look like a teenage 
bedroom, you'll see the bed there in the center. Um, and the images are, of course, um, those of AIDS cultural productions from the uh, 1980s and 1990s. You'll see out the window there's um, an ACT UP political funeral. Um, closer to us on the left, there's some other ACT UP images. Uh, you'll notice the Keith Haring drawing on the other wall, um, just as a few examples. Um, and there's, of course, on the other side, uh, Justin Bieber wearing inexplicably an ACT UP t-shirt. Um, and um, images of uh, corporate campaigns for AIDS activism. Um, and these emblematic signifiers, um, through the emblematic signifiers, the artists assert that the nostalgic focus on AIDS of the past results in an important neglect of the contemporary nature of the AIDS crisis and therefore prevents critical life-saving actions from being initiated and put into place. This poster for me and my project, I should note, is centered in critical archival studies. Um, so this poster generated a lot of, uh, they were actually put up in three different cities um, and then put up online. And it generated a lot of discussion, a lot of intergenerational discussion, particularly amongst those interested in AIDS activism and art. Um, and so those, extend, those conversations extended into the archive. And of course, some of these images uh, though obtained through Google are archival images. Um, and so I'm interested in how uh, in the three decades since AIDS was first identified and entered the realm of public discourse, how it has become far more than a biomedical event. Um, the HIV AIDS crisis as I see it is a fundamentally cultural phenomenon as well that has generated a vast body of representation, even greater collection of experiences, affects, knowledge, and cultural activism. And an important part of that current cultural activism, it could be argued, is the imperative to build an archive of AIDS knowledge that would otherwise be neglected, marginalized, suppressed, or forgotten. And so as a result, I'm going to be looking at just a couple of the archival projects that have been developed globally to collect, preserve, and make accessible political, artistic, and medical knowledge. Um, and so I'm deeply interested and engaged in the issues of kind of how archives can capture um, or relate to kind of human experiences that are difficult to document, whether those are um, embodied experiences or feelings. Um, and so for me, this project will be about what the work of nostalgia does or doesn't do and how it shapes um, the experiences, understandings, commodification, and memory of HIV AIDS through the archives and its activist movements. So I'm happy to talk more about that project during Q&A, but I wanted to kind of bring together those two ends, so thank you.